Hey there guys, this is Mr. Herbst here and today my focus is going to be on sex selection. Um, now when we talk about sex selection, we always try to refer it back to evolution. More specifically, we go ahead and refer it back to natural selection. To review real quick, natural selection is where the organisms that are most fit to a specific environment will be the ones to pass along their genes into the next generation. So if we take a look over here, uh, let's say that our starting population is organisms that here are, are like gray. There seems to be this selection towards um, this darker color. Well, if we think about, if we, if we refer back to sex selection, and sex selection is simply defined as where um, there are changes in males and females that will that will increase their ability to secure a mate. So there are certain behaviors that there's been between males and females that will allow them to kind of secure who they're going to mate with. Now if we talk about sex selection and refer to natural selection, why would it kind of be good that certain organisms are choosy on who they mate with? And we'll focus on that in a little bit. Now we often find that that organisms that do practice sex selection are what we call dimorphic. If an organism, if organisms are dimorphic, it means that the males and the females uh, are different within a certain species. And so if we look over here, this is a male peacock, and this is the female peacock. Peacocks are dimorphic. You can probably think of a lot of different examples of animals that are dimorphic. Human beings certainly are one. Now when it comes to mammals, generally, uh, the majority of the time, the males are the ones that are going to be bigger and stronger than the females. Now the first thing I want to talk about in terms of sex selection is female choice. This simply is where the females actually are kind of choosy on who they get to mate with. And they do that on the basis of um, how, well, how, how well the male displays himself. And no other example is, is better than the male peacocks. If you look at this male here, um, he is displaying himself. And now when I look at a male peacock, I just go, wow, that is like so awesome. Look at all those feathers. That's absolutely amazing. But, and, and, and they look really awesome to me. I can't tell the difference. But something here in this female is telling that her to either mate with him or not or, or, or pass him up and try to choose a different mate. Um, so the females actually have a choice kind of on who they want to mate. Another really good example of sex selection is male competition. Now, if we think about it, um, you know, males have the ability to produce or father many offspring very quickly. For example, one male may be able to produce 50 offspring in a day. But females have to go through this whole process called pregnancy that takes them a lot longer. And they don't have the ability to produce offspring very quickly. So because the males have the ability to plant their seed in a lot of different areas very quickly, there becomes a lot of competition um, amongst males. And so there, it, brings apart, it brings about this idea of cost-benefit analysis, whereas like, kind of, what is the benefit of, of males fighting each other? Here we have these baboons. All these baboons over here are males. If you think about it, what, what kind of is the benefit of them fighting each other? Well, the, the main benefit would be that they're going to get higher up on the dominance hierarchy. The dominance hierarchy is um, much like in our society, our human society, we have these ranked individuals of importance. Perhaps maybe the president is the highest up on the dominance hierarchy, um, if you look at it that way. Well, baboons and a lot of animals tend to form dom dominance hierarchies, and the higher you up on the dominant, uh, dominance hierarchy, the more likely um, an organism is to, to be able to have access to mates. Now, that also comes with a lot of costs. Trying to be high up on the, on the, on the uh, dominance hierarchy means that you risk serious injury, if not death. And now it's actually pretty cool. What we find is that there are some baboons that are actually just like how we are, human beings, there's some baboons that are lazy, that are fine going on about all their life just kind of eating and napping all day long, and they don't really try to fight males too often. They sort of just kind of wait for that that perfect time when maybe maybe a, ma a female will come across their path, but they don't really try to compete for females so much. Pretty cool behavior in ba and bamboos. Um, so a little bit more about male competition. A after we after we they go through that uh, sort of fighting phase, it brings about a territory. So males have a territory, 
and they try to defend that territory from competition. Now, this songbird right here may look real cute and everything, but this songbird has a little bit of a dark side. That songbird is a male, and it's singing not only to attract other females, but it's also singing to tell other males, hey, stay away from me. If you come near me, you better, better, you better be ready to fight me. And so that's kind of one of the ways that males defend their territory. I'm going to sort of shift gears here. And I'm going to talk about sociobiology. Well, sociobiology is, is where we take the principles of evolution and we sort of um, apply it to the study of behavior in animals. More specifically, kind of uh, what is the evolutionary benefit of living in a society, being a social animal? And there are some really good examples, other than human beings, of animals that live in social or societal groups. Um, ants are a great example. They build awesome societies where they have ranked um, individuals. They have individuals that do certain things. And also is uh, termites. You may not know this at first glance, but this is actually a termite mound. And it's huge. Some of them can get real big. To put it in perspective, I know it may be hard to see, but right in there is a person standing on the termite mound. Termites are another organism that, that really uh, build awesome societies. And with societies, building a society, comes this idea or this uh, behavior called altruism. Uh, that is where um, certain behaviors in individuals may actually reduce their fitness. But for the whole species as a whole, it increases the fitness. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there are some organisms that practice altruism a lot. One is bees. Now, if you go up to a bee's hive and you rustle it up a lot, you're going to really make those bees pretty angry. And chances are pretty good they're going to sting you. And if you know a little bit about bees, if they sting you once, the bee dies. So the bee actually went ahead and sacrificed itself. But if you think about it, it reduced its fitness. All right, so the bee sacrificed itself. But as a whole species of bee or a whole population of bee, it actually increased their fitness. Because now you got stung and you're going to run away and stop bothering the rest of those bees. So the rest of the bees will go ahead and be able to survive. But that one individual got killed. So altruism is more of a behavior of sacrifice and selflessness where these uh, organisms realize that, hey, you know, I might die, but it's going to help out the population as a whole. Another species that does this a lot is ants, where we have these fighter ants that will come out, and chances are the, fire ant, the uh, fighter ants are going to die, but they're going to help save the queen. And sort of an inverse of altruism is reciprocal altruism. That's actually kind of what the word reciprocal means. It's sort of the inverse. Um, instead of an animal sacrificing itself, it goes out of its way to help or cooperate with another animal of the same species that there really is no immediate benefit. And what do I mean by that? If you take a look at this monkey over here, this monkey here is, is picking out um, the little uh, parasites and the little bugs that might live in the fur of this other monkey. So even though this monkey here gets little to no benefit, I mean, it might eat a few of those bugs, but really it's not a very big meal. Um, it goes out of its way to help this other one. And so reciprocal altruism is really, it's, it's kind of what makes societies great when we have the ability to help one another with no immediate benefit. Um, eventually, though, sometimes the behavior is repaid. Anyway, guys, that concludes sex selection. Uh, this is Mr. Herbst here. Don't forget to finish the Google form below for full credit. I'm signing off, folks. You all have a nice day.